Welcome to Adventures in Sociology and Criminology. I'm your host, Danielle McCartney, and today we're going to talk about labeling theory and how labeling theory explains deviant behavior. Let's get started. Labeling theory is based in theories of the self that emphasize how we develop a self-identity and how concerns about the self can push us into deviance. Labeling theory explains how labeling someone as deviant creates a self-fulfilling prophecy because we create the conditions for that person to become deviant even if they weren't before we started labeling them as deviant. So let's talk a little bit about developing a sense of self. Overall, labeling theory or identity theory, that it's sometimes called, argues that our behavior, how we act, is a process where we try to establish and confirm a workable self-image. Infants are not born with knowledge. Everything we think or know is acquired by associating with other people. Other people give us ideas about how to navigate the world, about what behaviors are appropriate and what behaviors are not appropriate, and about who or what we are. It's important to remember, though, that the process of learning is not a one-way street. Learning is a negotiation. Others give us information based on how they understand the world. That is, they have a particular definition of the situation, of particular acts, or of particular types of people. The definition of the situation is generally agreed upon. You know, it's a subjective understanding of what will happen in a given situation or setting and who will play which roles in the action. The definitions of a situation get shared through interaction so that many members of a particular culture share a very similar definition of the situation. So as children, we learn about these definitions of a situation. As children, we take on the perspectives of others, the perspectives other people are teaching us, and try it out. As we are developing our sense of self, this is called role-taking. We take on the roles of others and try them out. So in this process of role-taking, we think through how our reactions would appear to them, and then we perform some behavior. And once that behavior is out there, others observe it, think about what our behavior means, and then respond to our behavior based on what they think it means, what they think our intentions might be, and what the significance of our intentions or behavior might be. Then we process their responses and we react to those responses. The process of processing information and the subsequent reaction creates this kind of complex pattern of interaction. These patterns of interactions we see every day. Some of those patterns of behavior become habitual or routinized so that patterns of action, interpretation, and reaction become really a hidden process. We don't recognize this pattern. Our experience just becomes true and we rarely reflect on how the action, response, reaction starts or how it affects the way we think about ourselves. Charles Horton Cooley talked about this process of learning who we are from others and how others react to us or how we think others see us as the looking glass self. He argued that the self, who we think we are, comes about through three key elements our imagination of our appearance to others, our imagination of that other person's judgment, and then a self-feeling such as pride or shame. This process helps us develop a mental image of our emotional structure as separate and distinct, a separate and distinct being from others. This is our sense of self. We come to know ourselves through the social reactions of others. These are called reflected appraisals, the process by which our self-views are influenced by our perceptions of how others view us. We form an opinion about ourselves based on what we perceive other people's opinion about us are. So let's turn to the process of the self-concept formation. 
This process of building our sense of self starts when we're very young. As children, we develop an initial idea of who we are through those negotiations with adults and with peers. We engage in a process of trial and error. We engage in trial behaviors that are consistent with the budding ideas of who we think we are. These trial behaviors can be thought of as claims, claims about who we are. So after we've made a claim that we're the kind of person that is implied by the behavior that we're performing, we then wait for a social response to either confirm or deny the claims that we're making. So if others affirm what that behavior implies, then a tiny part of our self is formed. If the response of the social audience says that we are not or cannot be what we're claiming to be, then this disconfirming evidence undermines the portion of the self that is implied by the behavior that evoked that response. So over time, through this trial and error, by emitting behaviors that reflect a tentative self and observing the responses to the behaviors, we form a concept of ourself that is personally reassuring. And although this process starts when we're young, we should remember that self-concepts are always somewhat tentative. Who we think we are does change and shift over time. Even though we seem like or we think that the who we are is more or less stable. And because the sense of self actually is flexible and dynamic, this creates potential anxiety about ourself, about who we are. So we must constantly get confirmation of the self we have at any given time. When our sense of self is well developed and we get disconfirming evidence of who we are, we manage it in several ways. We might cognitively deny the response, you know, discount the source of the reaction. We could ignore the reaction as a fluke. But if our sense of self is not fully developed, or if the disconfirming responsive are massive and continuous, then we rework our self-image. We engage in the process again. We try out new behaviors in line with our new idea of self and then wait to see if others accept those new claims. So the search for a stable, satisfying, and socially acceptable self motivates all kinds of behaviors, either to form a self-concept through trial and error or to confirm a self-concept that is already formed. So Edwin Lemert helps us understand the process of developing a sense of self and of getting a deviant label, in addition to how we sometimes then embrace and act through a deviant label. He talked about this process in terms of the ways others react to primary and secondary deviance. So we all engage in a variety of behaviors every day. We all engage in even deviant behavior every day. We don't always know before we engage in the behavior that it's actually deviant. So think about a time you accidentally or unintentionally did something that you learned after the fact was wrong or bad or deviant. We'll call that primary deviance. Primary deviance is the initial act of deviance, whether it's intentionally deviant or not. So thinking about that time you did something deviant for the first time, particularly if you didn't know it was deviant, how did others react to it? Lemert argued that the act of engaging in deviant behavior doesn't mean we will think of ourselves as deviant particularly if the reactions from others are mild. If we and others can rationalize or excuse our deviant behavior as situational or as somehow context-driven, we won't label ourselves as deviant for engaging in that behavior. So an example for me was when I was a kid and I was caught shoplifting. The store security pulled me into their office and gave me the third degree, which I I tried to play off as accidental, like, oh, there's something in my bag. I didn't realize that Uh, they weren't buying it. (laughs) So they called my mom who came down to pick me up. 
And the story she told the security guard about my shoplifting made sure that the deviant label didn't stick to me. Basically, she explained away my deviance as being the result of a situational factor, the fact that my grandmother had just died. Because she had a plausible story to explain why I did what I did, and that it wasn't a reflection of some deviant trait that lived inside of me, the label of deviant didn't stick. However, if my mother thought of me as like a bad seed, that might have been a different story. Lemert argued that a label can be more lasting if the deviance is highly visible, if the deviant behavior is repeated often, or if the deviant behavior has a really severe social reaction. So if my shoplifting had been really high profile and not something my mother could explain away with a story, or if the security guard had pressed charges and I was arrested, or if I had been caught shoplifting many times before, then the deviant label would have been more likely to stick. So Lemert talked about this sort of process about when a deviant label is applied and then we adopt the deviant label and that becomes what he calls secondary deviance. So let's talk about this. This process of secondary deviance starts with some primary initial act of deviance. We can be intentionally breaking a norm or we can accidentally break a norm, but whatever it is, we have to do something that is seen as deviant by others. The example I'll use to illustrate this sort of sequence of deviance is the label my sister got as a wild child. It started young. When my sister and I were kids, my sister was always lagging behind, exploring some interesting thing on the ground, and just generally not getting in line with whatever our family wanted to do in the moment. Not a big deal, right? So this is primary deviance. This primary deviance has some social penalties for breaking that norm. That's the reaction that we get from others, and it tells us that what we did is deviant. When the penalties are mild, when they don't reach the level of what we'll talk about next as a degradation ceremony, they probably won't contribute to developing a deviant identity. So for example, you know, the dirty looks and heavy sighs we get when we violate a folkway. And remember, a folkway is mild. Folkways are the rules for everyday behavior, like how you're supposed to greet someone or, you know, how you act in an elevator. The sanctions we get when we violate a folkway are usually mild, you know, like the side eye or the raised eyebrows, you know, those heavy sighs, that kind of thing. But when we continue to engage in primary deviant behavior, which now has a label, we have a negative label that's been attached to that primary deviant behavior, but we still aren't necessarily internalizing or embracing the label of deviant yet. We're engaging in deviant behavior, but the label hasn't stuck. So for example, my sister continued to be curious about the world and to go off on adventures. Our mom didn't know where she was half the time. She became known as the wild child, but it wasn't quite internalized yet. For it to become internalized, often the social response has to be really severe. This is what we'll call degradation ceremonies. So once we continue our deviant behavior and the penalties get stronger and stronger, so for us to adopt a deviant identity, those social penalties and social sanctions usually need to be really obvious and really severe. When they are, when they're obvious and really severe, they reach the level of what sociologists call degradation ceremonies. A degradation ceremony is a ceremony or activity that transforms or is intended to transform the identity or status of an individual into an identity or status that is lower down in the hierarchy of a group or, or an institution. So for example, courts of law regularly enact degradation ceremonies, particularly when an individual is tried and convicted of a crime and the judge publicly admonishes the individual while reading out the verdict, and, then, and that changes the individual's marked status to the status of a criminal. Other public forms of punishment can include things like, you know, locking an individual in the stocks or something like that. So when deviance is illegal, we could get arrested and go through a degradation ceremony where the judge berates us.
when the deviance is not illegal but taps into standards of moral and ethical behavior, those are known as mores, you'll probably recall, we could get sanctions like, you know, other people physically restraining us, or we could be publicly shamed in the media or by our friends and families. These kinds of actions are degradation ceremonies. The public humiliation is designed to get us to rethink our bad behavior and often contributes to others treating us differently, whether we rethink our bad behavior or not. We and others can start thinking that we are deviant, not that we've done something deviant. So in the case of my sister, this labeling came to a head I, wouldn't, I don't know if it, or we'd classify it so much as a degradation ceremony. I'll leave this up to you. So my, when my sister was a teenager and, for example, if she wasn't home by curfew, our mom would wait up for her and give her a big lecture about why she should keep her curfew. And then she'd get grounded. She'd have to do more chores. She just would have higher penalties for her deviance. And at the same time, just so you know, I wouldn't get in trouble for my behaviors. I did stay out after my curfew, but my mom very rarely knew that because I'd always get in before she woke up. And if I did get caught, I'd come up with a good reason and my mom would accept it. So my sister kept getting harsher and harsher penalties and I kept getting away with it. This loop of primary deviance and social reaction continues. That can go on for a while. You know, at this point, when we are reacting our deviance might be even a hostile reaction to the punishers in this still this loop of primary deviance and social reaction. So for example, my sister got to the point where she knew she was going to get in trouble for whatever minor thing she did wrong. So she started doing things wrong on purpose and she'd engage in bigger deviance along the way, all in reaction to knowing that she was going to get in trouble. She figured if you're going to do the time, you might as well get the crime. So at some point, that cycle of primary deviance and social reaction, especially when there's a degradation ceremony involved, gets big enough that we enter into self-labeling. So according to Lemert, at some point we reach this stage where we identify with and embrace the label of whatever deviant category we've been labeled with. In the mild case of my sister, she did em embrace the label of wild child or black sheep. But she never really engaged in deviance that brings about the very severe social sanctions, such as, you know, getting kicked out of the house or getting sent to jail. But say she had gone to jail or gotten kicked out of the house or some other severe sanction. The next step would be to, once she accepted that deviant identity, to begin associating with other people with a similar identity. So this is once we have accepted the deviant label, we start interacting with deviant subcultures, other people who have that same kind of deviant label. As this part of this process, when we're interacting with people in this deviant subculture, we start to amplify our deviance. We start to engage in more of the kind of deviance that we've been labeled for. We start to intensify the amount or type of deviance we engage in. So at that point, this has now become secondary deviance. So secondary deviance is deviant behavior that results from being publicly labeled as deviant, internalizing that deviant label, and being treated differently, being treated as an outsider, being treated as a deviant person. So for example, if my sister had been you know, kicked out of the house for being a deviant, she would have been homeless or couch surfing. She would have had little supervision and lots of opportunities to engage in rule breaking. And that's to say, you know, once we've gone through this long process of engaging in deviance and receiving social sanctions, increasingly harsher so social sanctions, we come to the point where we agree with our punishers. We agree that we are what they say we are and we act in line with this new identity. In fact, often when people have accepted their deviant label, they'll create retrospective accounts that confirm the label. Retrospective accounts are when we look back at our past actions and we see them through the lens of our new identity. So we'll look back on our deviants and say, oh, yes, I was always like that. We'll start remembering incidents that prove that we are as deviant as they say we are. 
and other people engage in these retrospective accounts too. They'll look back at our behaviors or their interactions with us and say, oh yes, they were always a bad, a bad seed. And they'll come up with stories that provide more evidence that we are a deviant person, not someone engaging in a deviant behavior, but a deviant person. So overall, this process of how we become deviant and we start to intensify our deviance, our deviant behavior starts with engaging in some deviant behavior. Then there is a social reaction to that behavior. And then we go through what's called role engulfment, that we embrace the identity and that role, that deviant role, that deviant identity supersedes all other roles. So even if we have the role of, I don't know, daughter or mother or student or employee, all of those roles take a back seat to the deviant role. We engage in more behaviors then because we've adopted that deviant identity. So that's the explanation of the cycle of how labeling someone as deviant and then treating them differently, the social response to their deviant behavior can become internalized and then intensified. In this way, this creates that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. We treat someone as if they are deviant then they understand themselves to be deviant because of the way we've treated them, and then they engage in further deviant behavior. Well, that's it. That's it for labeling theory. I hope you learned a lot, and I'll see you next time.